first of all, welcome. Um, my name is Rob Roy Woodman. I am your host from the Davis Friends Meeting. And as we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we're gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Patwin people. Today, we're uh, there are three federally recognized Patwin tribes. Tachil Dehe Band of the Wintun Indians, of the uh, Wintun Indians, of the Calusa Indian community, uh, Kletzel Dehe Wintun Nation, and the Docha Dehe Wintun Nation. The Putwin people have, been, have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been uh, cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful for, to be here today on their traditional lands. Welcome to the second of a four part climate series of the Davis Friends Meeting, Quakers. We have had a film series on socially relevant issues for several years. And three years ago, uh, we started a speaker series. Both our film series and our speaker series were held at the Quaker Meeting House at the 4th and L. This climate series was to happen, uh, was to happen uh, in March 2020, but as you all know, we were suddenly had to stop because of the quarantine. So now a year later, with the help of our uh, friends of the, oh, I wish that slide was up here, to, uh, to acknowledge the, the uh, co-sponsors, uh, one is the, I don't remember, um, it's the first slide. Yolo Interface Alliance for Climate Justice. Thank you, thank you, and uh, Cool Davis. And without Cool Davis, we wouldn't be able to be putting this online because they've had the technology to um, do the registration and uh, the, the Zoom for us to use. So we're very grateful to them. Uh, there are, uh, well, the next thing is, all right, let me see my notes. Yeah. Uh, you'll probably enjoy this talk most if you're on speaker view. If you're on speaker view, I should be the only thing you're seeing right now. If you're not on speaker view, up in the right hand corner of your screen is a place where you can toggle back and forth between speaker view and gallery view. For this, um, for this talk, we're going to save the chat function for questions. So if you have a question for uh, Dr. Reef, you can put it in the chat and uh, I will ask the question of Dr. Reef, but if at that time you would unmute so that you and Dr. Reef can have a, a bit of a dialogue. And then when you're done with that dialogue, you can mute yourself again. The first talk in this series was Kim Stanley Robinson talking about his new book, the Ministry of the Future, and we had around 200 people to attend. And for our little Quaker meeting, that's quite an astounding number of people. The two remaining talks in this series will be on April 29th. Professor Hugh Safford will speak about fire trends in California, which is important to all of us. And on May 13th, Professor Aramis Kebrib will talk about green, the Green Moo Deal. Uh, these talks are at 7 p.m. and are also co-sponsored by Cool uh, Davis. And registration will be on the Cool Davis website. If you want to know more about the Davis Quaker meeting, uh, you'll find us on Facebook and we have a website. And now uh, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Mark Reef. Dr. Reef is a political philosopher who focuses on economic justice, how to reduce unemployment, how to finance education, how to reduce economic inequality, and how to support unionization. He's the author of five books and numerous articles in juried publications. 
His most recent book is The Unbearable Resilience of Illiberalism, The Rise of Trumpism and the Alt-Right. And now to discuss climate change and capitalism, Professor Mark Reef. Hi, everybody. Am I live now? You are live. OK. I don't see myself. Um, OK, well, that's all right. Um, so uh, thanks, uh, Ron, for that introduction. And of course, I want to thank uh, my friends at the Friends Meeting of Davis, as well as the people at uh, Cool Davis and, and, and the other groups here for setting this up. Um, so this is one of the first uh, talks I've ever given uh, by Zoom. Uh, usually I do this in person. And um, when I do it in person, I pace around and I wave my arms uh, and, and uh, uh, move into the audience and move out. So I feel a little restricted here tonight, but we'll see if, uh, we'll see if that works. Um, OK, so uh, let's get started. Um, I um, conveniently, the other day, I think it was Friday, maybe it was Saturday, there was an article in the, in the Guardian uh, newspaper. Um, I'm going to hold it up. I can't see myself, so I'm not sure if you're getting the picture. Um, it's an article called, The Planet Cannot Survive a Remor Remorseless Pursuit of Profit. And it's by Owen Jones. That's a picture of him right there, if you can see that. He's kind of a young guy, so uh, good for him for getting a piece in The Guardian. Um, and, and the first sentence of the article, uh, I'll just read that to you. Capitalism is on a collision course with human life and the future of our planet. Um, and the article goes on to make many of the arguments that I want to address tonight. Um, and uh, th these are some of the ones it includes. It says, capitalism prioritizes the pursuit of profit above all else. And the relentless pursuit of profit that's at the center of capitalism incentivizes people to do environmentally disastrous and other socially harmful things. Democracy, the argument goes, is powerless to control this since uh, there's often a direct correlation between political influence and economic power. This imbalance of political power is exacerbated because under capitalism, wealthy executives and shareholders of corporations are allowed to pass their wealth on to their children, thereby essentially permanently cementing the political influence of the rich. Um, now, I know a, a, a lot of people, this, this will seem familiar to a lot of people and will um, you know, uh, um, accord with their views, but I'm going to argue tonight that all of these claims are wrong. Not in the sense that these things aren't happening. They are happening. But in the sense that it's not true that capitalism ensures or even encourages any of these things. Indeed, if you believe the things in the article or you, you take it seriously, it seems to suggest that the only way to protect, protect the environment is to get rid of capitalism. Although it doesn't explain how socialism, which is the only real alternative to capitalism, is going to be any better with regard to protecting the environment, since the record of socialist states in this regard is dismal, even worse than that of capitalist states. And anyway, this kind of thinking, the idea that capitalism is the enemy of environmentalism, is a real problem. Because it not only suggests that environmentalists must carry and defend all the baggage associated with state-sponsored socialism. It also makes those who are concerned about the environment think that the task before them is much bigger than it actually is. And the task is already big enough. Doing something about climate change is already a really big task if we also have to overthrow the economic system in our, um, in our particular countries, that's, that's even harder. And the problem is this diverts our attention from the real issues involved in dealing with climate change and encourages us to, us to think that we have to do, even before we start addressing the issues of, of, of climate change, we have to do something about capitalism. So while the author of this piece no doubt has his heart in the right place, and I, I, my heart's in the same place, 
he and those who think like him are actually doing more to prevent us, I think, from making real progress against climate change than they are to help us uh, accomplish this. Indeed, I think it's one of the great sleight of hand tricks in the history of politics to convince those who take climate change seriously and want to do something about it, that they have to defeat capitalism in order to see their concerns addressed. So that's the article. But because the article doesn't reference all the arguments behind this sleight of hand trick in full, let, let me set them out for you again, just so we be sure we understand the thinking here. The argument is that capitalism says the economy is more important than the environment. And we ought not to do things that cost jobs or make life more expensive, especially when the economy is troubled, as it is now, and in practice, as it always seems to be, according to the same people. For if we do that, it's going to end up causing more harm than whatever good we might derive from protecting the environment. To the extent that putting the environment over the economy is what people actually want to do, the argument goes, the free market, which is established by capitalism, will direct our resources there because that is what capitalism is designed to do. The fact that the free market is by and large not directing resources to more costly but more environmentally friendly means of production demonstrates that people really prefer not to make the sacrifices that this would require, not all people, but a lot of people. Overriding this would be paternalistic, submitting the judgment of the few for the judgment of the many, and we shouldn't do that argument goes. Socialist societies do that, not capitalism, uh, and not capitalist ones. And as one of my students once said after making a similar comment, and we've seen how well that works out. Uh, in any event, the argument goes on, the capitalist society is a free society. And a free society guarantees freedom in all aspects of life, including in economic endeavors. Freedom cannot be overridden even if doing so would be in the common good. That's the whole point of it. Interfering with the market in order to require, acquire people to abide by various kinds of environmental regulation would be a violation of that freedom. And if we did this and succeeded uh, with regard to protecting the environment, would we be, we'd be establishing a precedent for doing it everywhere else? And then our political freedom, as well as our economic freedom, would surely disappear. Now, there are a lot of controversial claims in what I just said, so I'll start by unpacking these to be sure we have a shared understanding of what they mean. And I'll start with the most obvious one, which is getting a handle or better idea of what we mean when we talk about capitalism. It's perhaps surprising. There is no accepted definition of capitalism. This has led to a lot of confusion, unfortunately, because people are often trying to put a lot of political content into capitalism. And then, of course, branding everything else socialism as a way of undermining political views with which they disagree. But if we want to think clearly about what is going on, we need to avoid doing this. Every society needs both an economic system that provides a mechanism for determining how much of what goods should be produced and at what price these goods should be sold or otherwise distributed, and a political system that provides a mechanism for determining right, what rights we have against each other and against the government, and describes how we make priority decisions among the various objectives that are within the government's mandate to pursue. These systems are separate and independent of each other, or at least that's my argument tonight. And almost every mix and match possibility is possible. Okay, so what are the candidates for each kind of system? Well, the two main economic systems in operations today are capitalism and socialism. Capitalism says output and pricing decisions should be made by the free market through the price mechanism, which in turn responds to the law of supply and demand. Socialism says that these decisions should be made by the central government Considering, whether object, considering whatever objectives the government decides are important. Capitalism claims that a free market economy will lead to the most efficient allocation of economic resources, including labor, and therefore result in the greatest production of goods that people actually want. Socialism claims that the optimal, socially optimal allocation of economic resources can only be made by command. 
Capitalism says that in order to create a free market system, most economic resources must be privately owned. Socialism says that in order to ensure economic decisions take social welfare into account, most economic resources, including at least all heavy industry, should be owned by the state and thereby by the people, at least collectively construed. Now, of course, there's a variety of capitalist systems and a variety of socialist systems. No two, perhaps, are exactly the same. And the details all vary. But the members of each family all share the basic attributes, which I've described. So if you want to distinguish capitalism from socialism, what I've set forth is about all you can say without getting into what are really just different forms of each system or saying something very controversial about how certain political values are tied to one system or the other. So if we want to understand the economic systems on offer without getting into all these, what are often irresolvable political controversies, we need to abstract out in the way I've done and stop there. Use a very thin definition of both capitalism and socialism. Okay, so those are the economic systems on offer. What about the political systems on offer? Well, just as there are two great families of economic systems afoot in the world today, there are two great families of political systems. For our purposes tonight, I'm going to refer to these families as the right and the left, although things are actually a lot more complicated than this. But thinking of political views as simply being on either the right or the left will do for the purposes I want to discuss here. At least it will do if we distinguish between the moderate right and moderate left and the extreme right and the extreme left. Uh, if, if any of you are as old as I am, you remember a time when there actually was a moderate right. Indeed, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, was started by Richard Nixon, not someone that people ordinarily think of as a, a lefty. But the moderate right's now been almost completely obliterated, and those who used to be on the moderate right are now considered part of the moderate left. They haven't really changed their views. It's just that the scale of left to right has moved so far that it now seems like they're on the left. But if we look at the history of, of political ideas, they really still are on the moderate right. So most of the people who claim to be on the right today are on what are in fact on what we might call the extreme right. These are people who are climate change deniers and, or, and who want to protect the fossil fuel industry no matter what, because one of these people, as one of these people famously said, God wouldn't have given us all this oil if he didn't want us to use it. Now, one other clarification I want to make here. People use the word socialism to refer to a certain collection of political viewpoints sometimes. Sometimes they use it to refer to the, an economic system. Sometimes they use it to refer to this collection of political viewpoints. But if we do this, we end up just confusing matters. For what we're trying to get a handle on is whether adapting these, adopting these political views requires rejecting capitalism and adopting socialism as an economic system. So let's try to keep these two meanings of socialism separate. And so when I'm talking about socialism from here on out, I'm talking about socialism as an economic system. In any event, what your political values are determines where you fall on this right to left axis. As an economic system, capitalism can be employed and has been employed by states who fall anywhere on that scale from the moderate left to the extreme right. And socialism, in turn, can be employed by states who fall any on that scale from the extreme left to the moderate right, although being on the right is pretty rare for socialism. But in any event, there's a lot of overlap here. It's simply not true that one must be on the right to embrace capitalism or on the left to embrace socialism uh, as an economic system. And it's also not true that to be on the left, <coughs> you must reject capitalism and you must embrace socialism. Those are just not true. And in any event, we do ourselves a disservice by thinking that our arguments about political issues are really arguments about what economic system we should embrace. Economics, remember, is supposed to be about means. It's about how we get most efficiently to whatever objectives 
we have. Economists claim to be neutral between the ends to be pursued, and in fact claim that these need to be set through the political system. This may sound like a controversial statement, but it's, it's really not. It's expressly embraced by many economists, including very conservative economists, including most famously by the British conservative economist Lionel Robbins. Of course, as we all know, uh, as a practical matter, much economic policy has a lot of political ends smuggled into it. But this is because economists often fail to stay in their lane. They move into the lane of politics without acknowledging or even recognizing that they're doing so. And many other kinds of people support and encourage this because by importing ends into economic policy, they hope to use the impenetrability of economic argument to cut off political debate. So what I'm gonna do now is get to some specifics to show how uh, this occurs with regard to arguments about climate change. Now, the first thing we have to understand is that no economic system cares about people or the environment or anything other than the economy for that matter. That's not its job. I know socialists claim otherwise, but this is false. They think that because people technically own the means of production through the state, production decisions will by definition be made in the interests of the people. But while the people may own everything under socialism as a technical matter, they do not control how the means of production are used, how economic resources are allocated, or how output or pricing decisions are made. The managers of each business on orders from the state does that. And there's no reason to think that these managers or the people that appoint them will not act in their own interests or in the interests of those higher up in power, just as is the case with managers of corporations under capitalism. And even if some of these people do try to act unselfishly and try to achieve certain political ends, there's no reason to believe that these political ends will in fact be the ones endorsed by the majority of the people or otherwise be morally defensible. Hence industries in socialist countries were far worse polluters than the same industries in capitalist countries which in developed capitalist societies at least were forced to be a little responsive to environmental concerns. The point here being that to the extent, the extent to which either economic system works to the benefit or detriment of any individual or the bulk of its people or the environment is determined by its political system. That's the system that determines what society's values are and what should be done to ensure that those values are furthered rather than undermined by an unregulated economic system. Now, I know people on the moderate left often point to the Scandinavian countries as examples of how socialism can produce a high standard of living and a high level of social welfare. But these countries are capitalist. They're not socialist in terms of the economic system they employ. They just moderate the effects of capitalism with a lot of social welfare programs. They're socialist only in the political sense. In other words, they combine capitalism with a strong commitment to the various ends endorsed by the moderate left. So to the extent those who are resisting taking action on climate change are claiming that in order to do so, we would have to reject capitalism and adopt socialism, this is just false. It's an attempt, attempt to import political decisions that are meant to be decided according to the applicable political system into the realm of economics and thereby cut off political debate by arguing that the answers to these questions is predetermined by the particular economic system already in place. And this is true, even if the arguments being made sound like economic arguments. For example, claims that such and such a policy will cause inflation or unemployment or stifle economic growth or arguments of the like. Claims about what policies will have to ha will have what economic effects, remember, are all claims about the future. They're claims about what things we do now, what kinds of effects those will have in the future. And claims about the future are always uncertain. No one knows exactly what economic effects of a particular policy will be. Sometimes we can make probability determinations. In other words, we can claim that a certain policy is likely to have a certain effect or unlikely to have a certain effect, or we might even claim that it could be a toss up. We don't know what it's going to do, but there's always uncertainty. And wherever there's uncertainty, there's risk. And wherever there's risk, 
we need a moral principle to help us decide which risks we should take and which we should eschew. That's the job of political morality. Besides, deciding whether a little more unemployment or inflation or slightly slower growth is worth whatever is to be gained by uh, thereby, if this were indeed what would occur, are decisions about the relative priority to be given the various political ends we endorse. These priority decisions are again supposed to be made through the political system. They're not dictated by our choice of economic system. So whenever an economic system is making, it, whenever an economist, excuse me, is making an argument about what we should do or shouldn't do, he or she is necessarily importing some conception of value into that in order to come to a view on how we deal with the uncertainties and priority questions involved. Here's how that works. Let's start with this idea of the free market. One of the go-to arguments made by anti-environmentalists is that embracing capitalism means embracing the free market, and that means rejecting all attempts to regulate the market. The implied claim here is something like markets come into existence all on their own, like some sort of miracle, um, and that uh, all government intervention does is get in the way of the natural workings of the market. We should just get out of get out of the way and, and, and let the market does do what it does. But there's a difference between market enabling and market interfering regulations. Even if you shouldn't have the second kind of regulation, you must have the first. Rules that describe what kind of conduct can or must be done to participate in the market and make exchanges through it are the market enabling kind. Think, for example, the game of baseball. There must be rules that prevent the batting team from sending their players out onto the field uh, to block the view of the defending team and prevent them from catching the ball. If there wasn't such a rule, you wouldn't have the game of baseball. You might have something that looks more like football. So market enabling regulation is not just permitted by capitalism, it's required because to have a market, you have to have rules about how one enters the market how one conducts exchanges, what's permitted and what's not. So this would include rules prohibiting fraud, theft, coercion, rules requiring the performance of promises and rules prohibiting anti-competitive conduct because a market that's infected with anti-competitive conduct is not a free market. Even rules prohibiting di discrimination are market enabling because if people are excluded from the market despite their talents and abilities, Economic resources, which include labor, are not being allocated efficiently. So suffice it to say that the vast amount of regulation that uh, exists today, uh, indeed almost every kind of regulation that exists today, can be characterized as a form of market enabling legislation and therefore not somehow contrary to the idea of the free market. Of course, even when market uh, regulation is not strictly, strictly market enabling, that doesn't mean it's necessarily market in interfering. Sometimes the market can break down. There can be various kinds of market failures caused by a variety of problems, not just anti-competitive conduct. One of these arises in the context of what are called collective action problems. Another arises out of the problem of what economists call externalities. These conditions are both situations where capitalism itself says regulation is required because these conditions distort the free market. So regulation in these instances cannot be considered impermissible interferences with the market. So let me talk a little bit more about each of these different kinds of problems. I'll start with the, the last first, the idea of externalities. The goal of capitalism is to facilitate the most efficient allocation of society's resources. In a perfectly competitive market, economists tells us that everything would sell for its cost of production. In other words, profit itself would be unobtainable. Of course, almost nothing does sell for the cost of production in real life, but this is because markets are rarely perfectly competitive. Some market distorting factor is almost always in operation, usually more than one. And that's what, another reason why we need various kinds of regulation to correct for this, to ensure that the market remains substantially free as capitalism requires. 
But prices can deviate from the cost of production in two ways. Sometimes they can be too high. We all know about that. But sometimes they can be below the cost of production. And one way this can happen is when production involves what economists call externalities. Externalities are cost of production that are imposed on third parties and therefore need not be accounted for by the seller in the price. This is bad because when things can be sold for, for less than their cost of production, the market is distorted. More of these things are produced and sold than is economically efficient. And this undermines what capitalism was designed to do, which is to make the most efficient allocation of resources possible. As a result of these goods being underpriced, less of other things are produced and sold, and the allocations made through the free market is suboptimal. If this were corrected and all goods were properly priced, the market would produce a different allocation of resources, and this would re reflect society's true preferences and therefore accomplish what the free market is otherwise supposed to accomplish. Now, uh, when I say this, people sometimes react to this by saying, how is selling something below cost a bad thing? Isn't this just a really good deal? Indeed, everybody loves a really good deal. Why would I wanna stop that? The problem is that if the price is below cost because of externalities, you really aren't getting a good for below cost. Part of that cost is simply being paid by you and everyone else in the terms of the harm caused by the externality. And since reversing this harm often costs more than preventing it from arising in the first place, and often vastly more, then you aren't getting a good deal at all. And pollution, of course, is the textbook example of such an externality. If I make cars that pollute the environment in a way that needs to be rectified, then the cost of doing so is a cost of producing those cars. If those cars could be sold without accounting for this cost, they will be underpriced. And if they're underpriced, more of them will be sold than would otherwise be sold and society will have more pollution than it is really willing or even able to pay to clean up. The free market in this case has failed. And if we want to correct for this failure, we need to introduce regulation to do this. This regulation is not an interference with capitalism uh, and the free market. It's a way of protecting it. Those who are claiming that the free, that free market failure should not be corrected are simply putting profits for automakers about preventing climate change. Now, you may want to do this or you may not want to do this. But in either case, this is a value determination. And it's a determination based on political values, not economic ones. Capitalism does not say we should ma maximize profit. Indeed, if we wanted to do this, we would have to have every kind of good imaginable produced by a monopolist, for monopoly profits are greater than profits to be earned in a competitive marketplace. That's why monopolists form. What capitalism says is that we should ensure an efficient allocation of resources because this maximizes the production of what society really wants their desires having been revealed because they're willing to pay what these goods cost to produce. And this doesn't happen when the market's distorted by externalities. Thus those on the left trying to use climate change as a rallying cry to overturn capitalism are simply misunderstanding what capitalism is. And those on the right trying to defeat efforts to control climate change by arguing that this would, this would be a form of socialism are in fact more anti-capitalist than the socialists. For what they're really doing is arguing that the personal political values they espouse should override the economic values of capitalism. So that's externalities. Let's look at collective action problems now. These are problems created by situations in which what any particular participant does depends on what he or she thinks other participants will do. And what they will do depends on what they think he or she will do. These situations pose problems in a free market because given our uncertainty about what other people do, we may find it impossible to cooperate even if we want to. And we'll end up making choices that make us all worse off than we would otherwise be. One famous example of this is a problem called the tragedy of the commons. Here's how that works. Imagine a village 
that surrounds a central field, the commons. The village is composed of sheep farmers who live around the perimeter of the commons and, gaze, and graze their uh, sheep on it. But the commons is looking a little worse for wear lately and the farmers realize that if they continue to graze their herds on the commons as they have been in the past, the grass will disappear and they will have nowhere to graze their sheep anymore and their sheep will all starve and so will they. So they agree that each farmer will limit his herd and only graze a specific number of sheep on the field. Well, what happens? Well, each farmer may reason as follows. Look, I might say to myself, if everyone else limits their herds, the field will be fine and I can graze as many sheep on it as I want. On the other hand, if I limit my herd, but enough others do not, the field will be destroyed despite my restraint. So I might as well graze as many sheep as I can because I'm better off either way. That's important to understand. Each person re reasons that no matter what other people do, they are better off if they don't comply with the restrictions. But of course, if everybody reasons this way, no one will limit their herds and the field will be destroyed, even though no one wanted this to happen. So this is not a problem that can be left to the free market to resolve. Everyone may want to do the right thing, but because everyone fears that some people won't, no one does. Regulation is accordingly necessary to provide assurances to everybody that most people will indeed comply and that non-compliers will be punished. This allows everyone to trust their neighbors and to trust that their joint agreement for solving the problem will be followed. And of course, the same problem arises when it comes to doing something about climate change. Nobody, I think, wants climate change to get out of control but they're unwilling to limit their own pollution unless they have sufficient assurances that other people will do so and climate change will be stopped or at least slowed. And the problem here is even more difficult because we're talking about nations rather than individuals or companies within the same society because there's even greater doubt about compliance and about what compliance even means when we're talking about international cooperation. Must everybody abide by the same limits, for example, or do more developed countries have to have been the biggest polluters in the past, have to abide by stricter limits? How do we decide whether the agreed limits are being met? And how do we punish those who fail to abide by the relevant limits? These problems are difficult to solve, but the idea that a commitment to capitalism prevents us from trying to solve them is just nonsense. These problems arise because of free market failures. And so capitalism actually gives us a reason to address them, not a reason to avoid doing so. But some people make an even larger argument. They tie capitalism together with some conception of freedom. We hear the argument that regardless of what might be socially beneficial, freedom is an important value. And capitalism establishes that freedom is more important than anything else. Any kind of regulation that infringes on freedom with regard to economic activity is as reprehensible as a regulation which infringes on political freedom. And therefore, it's the first step down a slippery slope towards totalitarianism. This argument, I think, is nonsense, but seeing that it's nonsense is more difficult because people often mean very diff different things when they talk about freedom or liberty, as I'm going to refer to it from now on. And they're often not very clear about which of these different things they are referring to when they talk about liberty or what kind of liberty capitalism supposedly enshrines. They slide back and forth between one meaning and another when they talk about liberty and this leads to a lot of confusion. What most people mean when they talk about liberty is what philosophers call negative liberty, freedom from restraint. But saying negative liberty is freedom from restraint is not tantamount to saying that any interference with negative liberty is bad and should be avoided. Indeed, think about it. Government interferes with our negative liberty in millions of ways every day. If it didn't, life itself would be impossible. Rules that prevent us from killing one another or stealing our neighbor's stuff or for discriminating against certain classes of people in business or housing or education all interfere with negative liberty. We would have more negative liberty if we could do these things. But that doesn't mean the rules preventing this are impermissible. The question is always whether the interference is justified. 
and capitalism doesn't have anything to say about that. The extent to which an interference with negative liberty is justified is a matter for our political system to decide, not our economic system. Prohibiting theft, violence, fraud, and so on is an interference with negative liberty, but it is a justified interference given our political values. And regulating industry to address climate change is also justified if that is what our political values say we should do. Nothing in capitalism suggests otherwise. Now, I know uh, some people will be thinking that neoliberals disagree with this, that they claim that anything that infringes on economic liberty is bad. Well, to the extent this argument is really based on some political theory, then it's, as wrong, it, then it's wrong as long as this is not the judgment that our political system says our society should embrace. But it's wrong as a matter of economic theory too. Economic liberalism, the idea that all regulation of the economy is bad is a theory that traces its lineage back to Adam Smith. But surprisingly, Adam Smith never said that the, uh, the economy does best if it is left completely unregulated. At the time he was writing, the economy is subject to stifling regulation, mostly designed to protect certain trades from competition and to protect farmers from agricultural imports. So Adam Smith didn't say that all economic activity should be unregulated. He just wanted to the government to lighten up. He argued for moderation, not from going from one extreme to the other. So people who cite him as being opposed to all regulation are just making stuff up. The argument nevertheless that his idea of economic liberty did rule out all regulation was first made by neoliberals in the 1930s. But there was another view embraced by some Adam Smith inspired economic liberals at the same time. They called themselves ordo liberals and they believed that maintaining a free market not only required that the government not interfere with certain kinds of economic activities, they also believed that it required the government to interfere with certain kinds of private activities that distorted the free market. These activities, they argued, needed to be regulated if we're going to maintain freedom in the sense of justified, only justified interference. So Adam Smith was not against all kinds of regulation as an economic matter. He was against the wrong kind of regulation and in favor of the right kind, just as is, is the case with the regulation of negative political liberty. Interference with negative economic liberty is not necessarily bad or good. It simply has to be justified. Whether something is justified depends on the reasons for regulation. So once again, you can't get a blanket ban on all types of economic regulation out of Adam, Adam Smith and economic liberalism. And neoliberalism is wrong to the extent it suggests that capitalism says anything else because there's another branch of economic liberalism that says exactly the opposite. Now, let me go back to the article I started uh, by referring to, um, which talks about the remorseless pursuit of profit. The argument is that capitalism enshrines the remorseless pursuit of profit. Well, capitalist, capitalism does posit that people need incentives to do socially productive things, and it takes profit to be an important incentive. But this is not equivalent to saying that all that the relentless pursuit of ever greater amounts of profits must be protected under the capitalist system. Indeed, capitalism enshrines the idea of the free market, as we've already seen, and a free market, or at least a meaningfully, uh, uh, in a free market, is a perfectly or at least meaningfully competitive one. In a free market, remember, if profit is available from a certain kind of activity, if it's large, then new players will be attracted by these high profits and enter the market, right? Because a free market has no restraints on, on entry. And these new entries will continue until price competition between all the new entrants drives the profits down to a reasonable level. If new entry is not possible or it's not easy, this can only be because there are what economists call barriers to entry, something preventing new entrants from coming in despite the high profits, or because there has been an unlawful conspiracy among existing market players to exclude new entrants. These are both distortions of the free market and therefore maintaining a free market requires using regulation to eliminate these problems, not refusing to engage in regulation and thereby ensuring that these distortions continue to exist. So the presence of extreme profits for say oil companies 
is not something that capitalism allow, allows. It's the failure to regulate these interest industries as capitalism requires that allows such profits to exist. And if we did regulate them to correct for the market failures that allowed for these extreme profits, these companies wouldn't have the money to engage in efforts to distort the political system that they now have. And besides, if we went to socialism, there's no reason to believe that oil companies would behave any better. They would still wield enormous influence on socialist politicians. And again, regulation would be required to offset this. So there's nothing magic in switching to socialism here, even if this were not completely unfeasible under the current circumstances. I want to close by mentioning something about technical, technological change. Joseph Schumpeter, the conservative Austrian economist who taught at Harvard for most of his career, once described the process that capitalism endorses as one of creative destruction. What he meant by this is that as technology improves, old forms of production are destroyed and new forms created. This can cause some distortion in the short term as economic resources, especially labor, get reallocated. But ultimately, the economy becomes more productive as a result, and this creates more goods and more wealth that can then be distributed to everybody. Just because there is more wealth and more goods to distribute to everybody, everybody doesn't mean that's exactly what will happen. But capitalism does not say we can't use regulation to ensure that it does happen. Indeed, when this doesn't happen, it's mostly the result of certain goods being overpriced and labor being underpriced. This is again a market failure. So capitalism says we should do something about it, not ignore it. In any event, by protecting fossil fuel based industries, we are in fact preventing creative destruction. This is anti-capitalist, not a way of abiding by our commitment to capitalism. The fact that some people will be displaced as part of this process is a reason to develop programs to assist them find a place in the new economy, but it's not an argument for preventing creative destruction from taking place. And so I think I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Um, I do have a couple of questions here. Um, and if anyone else has questions, please put them in the chat. Um, the first question is, so it sounds like you're saying that both the left and the right are doing something wrong here. The right is arguing that a commitment to capitalism requires that we reject most attempts to regulate pollution when this is not true. The left is doing something wrong by buying into the argument and arguing for socialism when we could do, more easily do something about climate change from within capitalism. Is that correct? Yes, that's exactly right. So, so I guess what I'm doing in, a, in my paper is, is, is criticizing people on both sides. Uh, I'm criticizing people on the right because they're making claims about what capitalism requires that just are not defensible. In fact, uh, capital, what capitalism does require is in most cases the opposite of what people on the right are claiming uh, and, and therefore doesn't give them any reason to uh, any support for their claims that we shouldn't address climate change. But unfortunately, a lot of people on the right have seem to have drunk the Kool-Aid here. Uh, they seem to accept this claim and also argue that uh, this is what capitalism requires and, and therefore we need to get rid of capitalism if we're gonna really be environmentally conscious. But as I, I said at the beginning, this just makes the work of dealing with environmental problems so much harder. Um, because regardless of whether we might say if we were just sort of creating a society from, a society from scratch, uh, we might choose a socialist economy rather than a capitalist society, you know, even if we might do that, I, I don't think we, we should, but even if we did, uh, that's irrelevant because we live in a society that's already made choices in this regard. And there's a certain path dependence here. Reversing those choices is enormously difficult, has huge transaction costs, and it's by and large politically infeasible. Anybody who thinks America is gonna be uh, scrap capitalism and become 
a socialist state is just is, is just dreaming. This is not going to happen. So the left here, I think, is playing into the right's hands to the extent people on the left are blaming capitalism itself for the failure to address climate change. I think the argument on the left would be much stronger if the argument was, we're not against capitalism, you're against capitalism. Capitalism says these things are distorting the market and we should be doing things to protect capitalism, to ensure there is a free market. So, um, so I do think that's a good way of putting what, what I've been saying and who I've been criticizing. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. What about cap and trade proposals that would uh, create a market in carbon uh, credits? That seems like a capitalist solution, but it, it hasn't really gotten off the ground. Why is that? Um, good question. Yes, uh, it is a capitalist solution in my view. It's exactly the kind of solution uh, capitalism um, uh, suggests we should do. It's creating a market to deal with these problems. But, if, but it, it, it's, it's first of all, even if it were to uh, be fully adopted, it wouldn't by itself, I think, uh, solve the problem. I mean, we're way too far along for that right now. So it's only a partial solution at best, but I sort of alluded to this in my talk. The, the problem is, again, for this market to work, um, as in the, the uh, problem of the tragedy of the commons, people have to uh, believe that the various commitments of nations will be honored. And right now the market is too, it's too underdeveloped. People can't, um, people can't be sure yet because they haven't seen it, had enough experience in, in thinking that it will be honored and that it will indeed uh, work. And unfortunately, I think uh, the, Trump's rise to power really made this difficult because even though he's not in power anymore, what he did was make everybody doubt the reliability of the United States. And so even if we were to agree uh, to all sorts of things about addressing climate change, other nations might reluct be reluctant to abide by their agreements because they might think, look, so I'll do this for a, a, a little while. And even though uh, I trust, say, Joe Biden, as soon as Trump or the next Trump arises and, take, and takes power, America will change its mind and they won't do it and we'll all be uh, worse off for having sort of relied on them in the meantime. So it's gonna be very difficult now to solve that problem because creating trust between all the participants is much more difficult now given the policies of the Trump administration and the fact that these policies have never been really definitively rejected and might again um, be the policies of a new administration not so far off in the future. So that's why I think it hasn't, hasn't really worked. Um, here's another question from Bonnie Dixon. How can the, this understanding of capitalism be effectively communicated to more of the public? Do you have ideas for brief, simple, and easy, under, uh, easy to understand ways of conveying it? Yeah, great question. Yes, and I mean, I think that's- and Bonnie, you might want to uh, unmute so that you can dialogue and, and, and put your camera on so you can dialogue. Okay, I, I don't see Bonnie yet. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just start. Um, yeah, so I think that's a great question. Um, yes, we have to do this. And, uh, what, how do we do this? Well, we have to teach this in our universities, which we don't. Um, our politicians need to realize this and they have to start realizing it's not a good tactic to claim they're socialists. Uh, Bernie Sanders is not a socialist. He's a social Democrat. AOC is not a socialist. She's a social Democrat. In fact, even people who claim they're outright socialists are not socialists. They're only socialist in the sense, in the political sense, in, this, in the sense that socialism refers to sort of a group of leftish ideas. And we have to stop using that word to describe these views. It's just not true. And I think one of the things we have to do is we have to also start claiming, rightly in my view, 
that what we're doing is really trying to protect capitalism. Um, and, and this has to become part of our political re rhetoric on the left. And um, it's not, um, it, it can be done, I think, directly and simply. Um, I mean, the idea, for example, I think that capitalism it, 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 uh, approves of the idea of ex excessive profits is just nonsense. And I mean, I think all we have to do is tell the story of the tragedy of the commons to show that, or point out that uh, what capitalism supports is the free market, people on the right say this, and a free market means that you can't get excessive profits, right? You know you don't have a free market when people are earning excessive profits. That's the best uh, evidence that that's what's happening. And so, people who are trying to defend excessive profits are anti-capitalists. And maybe if we started saying that, it would have some effect. Thanks, this is Bonnie. I oh, hi Bonnie, okay. I forgot how to unmute and uh, yeah, thanks. I agree with everything you said, especially teaching about this understanding of capitalism in universities. And I would say maybe in high school as well. Yes, I mean, this sort of idea that capitalism is sort of opposed to anything on the left liberal spectrum is, it's just so widely used now and unchallenged too often. And that's a real problem. Part of the problem is that in universities now, despite the claim that universities are full of people on the left, that may be true as a whole, but it's not true in the fields in which I work in political philosophy and economics. It's not full of people on the left. It's full of people on the right. Uh, and so in these particular disciplines, the disciplines that are really about politics, they're dominated by people on the, on the right. And, and as a result, they're really teaching people the wrong thing. And, and, and this needs to be changed if we're going to make any headway, headway here. So thanks for that question. Yeah, thank you. We have another question from Jim Hartung. Uh, could you comment on the pros and cons of carbon dividends or carbon fee and dividends from your perspective? Well, yes, all these kinds of things, you know, are, are, are I think, can be good ideas. It depends on how they're designed. Um, but uh, again, they're, they're tweaks. They're not magic bullets. I mean, this problem is big enough that, you know, we can't just solve it with one idea. We're gonna need a whole basket full of ideas. And, and, and I think we're really gonna, the first thing we're gonna need really is a commitment to solving the problem and, and therefore of trying however many ideas there are to see what works best or what combination of ideas work best. And so, um, you know, like, you know, uh, just selling and buying carbon credits, these things are just, um, they'll help. Again, if we can get international agreements that people believe the Americans will comply with, uh, they'll help. If we can't do that, then you know we have to do it some other way because it's just not going to work. And especially right now, since American credibility is almost zero, um, I guess I'm, I, I think that we need to really work on uh, remedies that don't require international agreement or as much, or maybe we need to work on uh, unilateral uh, um, positions. We need to say, this is what we're gonna do. We're, we're gonna reduce our carbon, carbon emissions you know, more than the Paris Accords, doesn't matter what other, anybody else does, or we're gonna take this action, or we're gonna support the development of new technologies like we supported the development of a coronavirus vaccine. Imagine if we put those kinds of resources into developing clean energy. Uh, and, and, and since there is a, outside of America, people are much more in, interested in buying things with clean energy than they are in America. So again, if we actually did this, this would be uh, you know, potentially an, a new industry that we could um, we could thrive in and, and we can do this without other people's agreement. Indeed, the fact that other people aren't doing it is, is good for us. 
right now, of course, we're not doing it and other people are doing it. We don't make solar panels anymore. The Chinese do all that, I think. And I think there's somebody in Sweden who does that too. Um, but um, we need to start thinking about uh, doing things that um, will eventually become the new industries. You know, when cars started, horses were much more convenient, right? You know, they were reliable. You got on one and it went where you were going. You got in a car when they first came out, you know, maybe it didn't start, maybe you didn't have enough gas, maybe it broke down. It took a long time before those things seemed better. And so there needs to be a time where we support infant industries so they can learn by doing and get getting better. And I think under the current climate, that's probably what we have to do now uh, since the chances of international agreements is, is so, I don't know, it's so chancy right now, I think. Mark, this is my own question. And that is, you talked about um, politics and economics and that the job of politics is to regulate the, the market. But it seems to me that there's at least two other uh, regulatory possibilities. And one is the courts where industry changes because of lawsuits. And the other is people on the streets. And, um, and uh, when I say people on the streets, I include people who uh, are choosing to buy or not to buy things. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good examples. So let's talk about lawsuits first. You know, you're, you're actually, you're, you're absolutely right. Sometimes um, moving forward is done by the courts. Now, this is not supposed to happen. Uh, and, and when it does happen, it usually happens because the legislature has failed to, um, to address a widespread problem. And uh, let's talk about safety in automobiles, right? Now we have a lot of regulation about what's required if you're gonna sell an automobile, how safe it has to be, what kind of crash, speed crash it has to resist, all that kind of stuff. Um, but this started because of a case in New Jersey that held uh, manufacturers liable for people injured when the cars weren't safe enough. And the fear of this liability is what made car companies start building safer cars. Regulation followed, but it was really a step taken by the courts. So the courts can be leaders in this area and they should be. Um, one way, for example, uh, if we made it possible for people to sue companies that made products overseas in violation of our own uh, environmental laws, in other words, had the product been made in the US, it, it wouldn't have been permissible to do it that way. It's only permissible because we make it overseas, they have uh, much less restrictive environmental laws. If we allowed people to sue uh, for, for products that did that, then of course that would change, right? People wouldn't do it. So it may be the case, given the impossibility, it seems of getting any, any serious regulation through Congress, that maybe the courts have to do this. The problem is under the current environment, the, the courts are now even more conservative than the, the uh, legislature. So again, this is a real practical problem um, and would take some uh, you know, enabling legislation to get there. And so the other example you gave is, is people protesting. I think this is, I think protests are good I, I think it's unlikely, and, and I think if they're joined with real proposals, um, they're helpful. On their own, I think they're almost gonna do, never gonna do anything. Um, I mean, look at the pro proposals, look at the protests that have arisen um, out of the killing of unarmed black people for decades. And we're still arguing about the same things. And so I'm not real hopeful that, that protests are gonna be the spearhead here. If at some point uh, they may make politicians feel more comfortable about taking you know, certain risky positions. So uh, I think it's certainly a good thing to do, but I think we shouldn't 
count on it too much. At least well, one of the one of the things I've heard said is what the environment needs is a good lawyer. <laughs> yes. But, but since corporations are persons, is there any possibility of personhood for the environment? I think not, certainly not in this judicial environment. Um, and again, you, you want to ask, okay, what would that get us? Uh, again, it might allow us, it, it might allow people to sue for damage to the environment um, in more cases than they currently can. Um, but they already can do that. So I think that's, again, that's kind of the, the most difficult way to get there. And the, the, the question in environmental cases often is that the individual industry injury to any particular person is very small. Uh, and um, so it doesn't scare anybody, but we have a system of class actions, which allows people with large numbers of people, the very small injuries to join together. And if you do that, you get big numbers. Um, and uh, there are already doctrines of law that says a defense, so here's a possible defense, we'd go, well, how do you know that your sea level rise in your particular part of Louisiana is due to my pollution? Everybody pollutes, and so maybe it's somebody else's pollution. Um, and there are already defenses like that have already been made in in in, in drug cases, for example, people who are harmed by, uh, by by taking certain drugs. And the courts in California have been in the, the lead in this, in that they've devised they've devised um, theories for for sort of holding defendants liable based on market share, uh, depending on your uh, market share contribution of pollution, you would be responsible for a certain percentage of the, the damages. And there's statistics out I just read recently that I think 10 companies in Europe are responsible, maybe it's in Germany and not Europe, I can't remember now for sure, but in, in one of those two, 10 companies are responsible for 90% of the pollution. So you don't have to get 100%. If, if those 10 companies are responsible for 90%, you, you could sue those 10 companies, you'd get a lot done. Um, so there are existing legal doctrines out there that we can use already. I think that's probably a, a, an easier path to follow than trying to create new and very unusual legal doctrines like giving personhood to things. Um, so I guess that, that would be my view on what we should do there. Thank you. If I could ask a follow up to the carbon dividends question. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby, so that's where I'm coming from. But, you know, uh, I want to just probe a little more your perspective because um, the, in the last uh, Senate and last Congress, there were about five different carbon dividends bills uh, introduced and different independent analysis said they would reduce uh, greenhouse gases between 50 and 90 percent depending upon the bill by, by 2050 and uh, and one of the uh, and there'll be another five or so submitted this year uh, and we'll have a better chance of passing because of the new administration but uh, and one of the features of those carbon dividend bills is that there's a border adjustment so any country that doesn't have an equivalent uh, carbon fee and dividend we would charge a, a import fee so that would, even if there wasn't an international agreement, that would kind of push other countries to come along and do the same thing to avoid the import fees. So I just wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit more. I'm, I'm, it seems to me that this is such a, a large market failure, not including those externalities. I don't see any way that we can really get to where we are gonna get without having something to fix that externality. That's not to say that we don't need other things, but without fixing that externality, I just don't see a path to get us there. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. Yes, I mean, that's exactly, I think, what we should do. Um, and we should do that with all kinds of things. For example, if, if a company closes down and moves its manufacturing overseas, where it then exploits local workers because that's allowed under the law of that particular country, I think we should impose tariffs on the imports of those goods that raise them in price to the level they would be if they were built by wor workers that weren't exploited. 
And if that were the case, then there'd be no incentive for doing this. Um, and so I think that's an essential aspect of sort of going it on one, one's own, as you, as you say. And because I think you know, the prospect of international cooperation is so low right now, I think that's really what we have to do. Luckily, the United States is a big market. And so most people who make stuff want to be able to sell here. Um, now, I, I guess you might worry that um, what they might do then is have sort of two factories. One factory, which doesn't pollute and does everything, you know, we would do if it was in the United States. And that makes goods that are then shipped here. And then a bunch of other factories which make goods for the rest of the world that pollutes. Um, and so I'm not sure where the 90% figure comes from. It sounds awfully optimistic to me, and it sounds like there are some assumptions in there that I'm, I'm not sure you know, are, 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 are that totally defensible. Uh, but obviously, it's, it would help. I mean, maybe, I mean, this is obviously going to take a long time to do. And so maybe the, the, the process here means we, we start doing that. And, and some companies respond by building two sets of factories, right? One that complies, one that doesn't. But after a while, their own people say, look, it's nice to live in the United States. You know, they don't have to, they can go outside without a mask on. The, they can see the clouds and everything. Why can't we get that? So maybe there'd be more pressure on um, the other countries to do that as well. And it might be the case that, you know, some countries want, want the prestige of being leaders here, right? Maybe China, who now wants to be a world leader, would say to itself, well, you know, just like we want to be a, a world leader in, in, in medicine now and drug development, we want to be a world leader in pollution control. So again, I don't think it, it would necessarily work right away, um, but it would help and it would set things up for the next step. I think given the size of the problem, we're going to have to proceed incrementally here. We're not going to overnight get you know, legislation or whatever that cures it all. It's just not going to happen. So we have to sort of give that up. And I think we, we're probably better off not overselling the effect of certain things because then you know, the right will say, see, they said it was going to do this and it didn't. Um, so we want to work on an incremental basis. They, and I they, think it's getting easier. I think they, that they, is getting easier because people are, 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 the public really wants us to work in that direction. So. Yeah, thank you very much for your comment. Just to clarify, the 50 to 90% that are calculated by independent sources was for the United States. I don't think anybody knows how to calculate it, how what the effect of carbon fee and dividend in the U.S. would have on the world. But the idea of the carbon fee is to increase it slowly, to start at 10 or $15 a yeah. ton of carbon and increase it a little bit each year. And, and so that the market has a time to adjust to it, basically. Exactly. That's how you would do it. I, I still think the 90% level seems high. And of course, the problem with pollution is some pollution is has relatively local effects, but a lot of pollution has essentially worldwide effects. And so I'm not sure how they would how they would account for that. It, that would suggest that 90% of the pro, the pollution in the United States are is caused by local sources, and that sounds high to me. But but maybe not. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Are there any other questions? Oh, no, are there any other questions? I just want to assure you that uh, we might have not seen it in the, the, the chat, it went to everybody, but um, the recording of this will be posted on the Cool Davis website. It'll be a YouTube site, Live Cool Davis. So if you subscribe today, you'll be notified when it's posted. You will also, we will also send you the link. We have lots of cool content here, there to explore as well. That's from Paul Davis.